Yo, so I wanted to do a little bit of an intro to the channel. Uh, I really don't know like what kind of direction I want to take this in, but I'd love to do a little bit of something on uh, the kind of businesses that I've been investing in, um, interested in, and all that kind of good stuff. And, you know, I've made a ton of mistakes investing. So, you know, I want to share a little bit of that knowledge, um, if it can help anyone else uh, avoid some of the same pitfalls that I've made, you know, that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, the direction I want to take it in is um, I'd run a bit of a blog on Twitter about some of the companies that I was interested in investing in. And uh, I prefer like video rather to reading. I think most people do as well. People enjoy stories being told to them instead of reading them uh, down on paper. So uh, the goal would really be just to, um, you know, every now and then when I find something interesting to look at, uh, post a bit of a video on that company, what it's all about, um, why I find it interesting and, you know, maybe even pricing that gets interesting. Um, but, you know, after, uh, over the last five or six years, um, you know, it's been a generally good market. It's been a good market for a certain kind of company. Um, and that regime has uh, more or less, you know, we could probably say it's come to an end. Interest rates are going in a di different direction than they were, you know, 09 to 2021. Um, and to that end, the, the companies that people think are valuable um, are changing. I don't expect this to be a, a long-term environment. And I think the best investments are always what Buffett says, companies that can earn a, a high return uh, on their capital or assets or equity uh, over a long period of time and are able to take some of those high returns and reinvest within their own business. Um, so I'd expect those companies to continue to do well. It's always difficult knowing exactly how those companies will continue, um, whether they'll, you know, whether a bad business will, a good business will emerge from a bad business. Those are all um, difficult questions, but the things that I have found successful for myself have been simple things, um, simple things that persist. Um, and where I have often failed and quite spectacularly is trying to identify things that are not good um, and that you think are, you know, are, are going to change. That, that has not been very successful for me at all. Um, and I think that's true of, of, of the greatest investors. Um, certainly, Buffett, if you go back and look at the big, big, big transactions, the 15 or 20 large investments that he made in his career, um, those were all, in, you, know, did not, you did not need 180 IQ to understand. You didn't need to, um, you know, have incredible, incredible industry specific insights into something that was incredibly niche, although Buffett did bring a lot of, um, did bring a lot of those specialities to, to some of his investments. But um, looking back on them, if you could understand those businesses, they were all quite straightforward. So what I'm looking for, uh, and all I'm doing is bringing my own experience about what has worked for me um, and, and what has failed. I mean, that's a better, that, that's a better um, way to, to uh, measure anything is, you know, if you can X out the failures, um, you're left often with quite a good result. But, you know, these are things that have been successful for me. Um, firstly, companies that with unusually good uh, economics, they don't necessarily need to be a high margin business. Uh, sometimes some of the you know, best businesses are actually uh, you know, razor thin margins. If I think about some of the distributors I've invested in in Australia, they're, they're usually quite low margin businesses, um, but quite often can have quite high returns on, on equity and tangible assets, um, and they can maintain those. Um, these companies should have a long history of profitability. Again, all the best investments I've made typically 
uh, these are companies that have been in business 30, 40, sometimes even 50 years. Some of the best public market investments have been companies that have been around for over 100 years. Um, so a long history of profitability certainly doesn't guarantee profitability going forward, but there is a, there's a higher likelihood that companies with a, with a history of, of strong profitability of that persisting. Some of these things that defy economic theory and competition, um, they persist. They persist over time. That's a characteristic of them. Um, another thing that's worked quite well for me in investments are companies that have a prudent capital allocation policy, or perhaps a better way of saying it would be a rational economic, uh, a rational capital allocation policy. And rationality can take many different forms. Um, there are times when it certainly makes a lot of sense for a business to invest heavily in SG&A and R&D because there is an a incredibly compelling market opportunity to go after and potentially monopolize. I would say that that's a hard thing. That's a very hard thing to make a judgment on. And there are plenty of businesses that look like they're doing that. Um, but uh, you know, I, would, I would argue that it's actually a very small percentage of the companies who say they're doing this who, who, who are actually doing it. Um, and sometimes you, know, you won't know about how good that investment was for perhaps years, perhaps even decades. Um, so prudent capital allocation typically looks something like um, this company is extremely profitable. Um, it has excess cash available at the end of the year. Um, part of that cash is distributed to shareholders. Um, and then a part of that cash is reinvested in a compelling business opportunity within the business itself. That's a, that's a setup that, that works quite well. Um, another thing I'd, I'd mention is management competency, or, or perhaps I'll get into this a bit later, but at least management predictability. Um, some of the, the very wor worst things that have happened to my investments have been um, management or, you know, particularly a founder CEO making uh, decisions that yeah, are not predictable at all. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later. Um, obviously, you want to look for companies, um, the companies that have unusually good economics will have high returns, whether that be on tangible assets, equity, or the capital they employ in the business. Um, I think that, that that's pretty clear. If a company's profitable and um, it's going to, you know, have good returns for you going forward, it probably had quite good returns going into the past as well. The company should have predictable economics. Um, so the internet, software, technology, et cetera, um, or plenty of other realms too, fashion, for instance, um, they're in the realm of, of extremist, Dan, as um, Nassim Taleb would say. The, the economics of an industry or how results are distributed within an industry are, are, are all you know, left and right tail events. It's, you know, it might all accrue to one person. It's difficult to identify who that person is in, in, um, before the event. Before the event. Um, so it's important that the business and, and even the industry that it operates within um, is predictable to some extent. And the unwinding of even some of the FANG businesses, some of the uh, online consumer businesses, internet businesses, SaaS businesses, um, these, are, these are all within the realm of, of extremist stand and external factors like COVID. Um, if they can massively, massively boost um, your business, they can also crush it. Um, so that's been another learning from COVID as well. Um, so along with this predictability, you know, you'd, you'd, you'd want the business to not be subject to extreme, extreme left tail outcomes. These can take, you know, many forms, uh, excessive government regulation, um, an extremely unpredictable competitive landscape. Um, again, you could have unpredictable management that decides to take the business in, in a direction that you as the equity holder perhaps didn't sign up for, um, can't underwrite, um, you know, completely unpredictable where this decision is gonna go. I mean, one of the best examples would be, you know, micro strategy or, or, even, or even a Tesla, 
you know, the, the CEO determines that they're going to invest X percent of the balance sheet in uh, cryptocurrency. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know how you get any insight on how that's going to pan out. It could be great. It could be um, not great. How you make a decision on that beyond me. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, you know, you'd love a business that a ham, ham sandwich could run. That's a classic Warren Buffett quote. Um, so there's a point here to be made about the predictability in management strategy, which kind of ties in with, you know, a good business. A great business is one that can be run by a ham sandwich is that some of these zero to one founders or entrepreneurs, um, while they're transformative for sometimes for society, but quite often for their equity holders, um, that's a trait that, that's better suited to venture capital rather than public equities. Um, if you have this distribution of outcomes where perhaps nine of your investments fail, but one of them 100 X's, the ability to iterate, be unpredictable, go after you know, new opportunities and be scrappy, is um, that's exactly what you need to make that kind of strategy work. When you're investing in a way where you're trying to keep your losses um, to a minimum and invest in companies that are predictable, that is exactly the opposite of what you want. And you could see that with a Bezos or a Zuckerberg. Um, is that while they have been outstanding, you know, zero to one entrepreneurs, um, there's a point in a business's life cycle um, where that can be uh, perhaps even uh, counter to the interests of the equity holders. So, you know, the, the counter example would be uh, Sundar Pichai at, Go at Google or um, Satya Nadella at Microsoft. These aren't people who are just... Um, taking the company's whole trajectory and strategy and balance sheet in a completely different direction um, than what the investors were expecting. And, you know, it, it, the way that these people want to go, it could be fantastic, but the problem is you just don't know. It's a, you're betting on the person. Again, betting on a person, that's a VC approach to investing. It's not, a, it's not necessarily a public equities uh, discipline. Uh, again, I found DCFs are an important exercise, not necessarily because they give you any insight into um, where the business is going or you know wh where value is, um, but it lets you. It illustrates why these points above are important. Um, the element that throws out any DCF is the discount rate. So the uh, whatever the weighted average cost of capital is, that. Um, can have tremendous impacts on the value of a business. If a business is extremely risky, unpredictable, um, it might only be around for a few years, even though the current market opportunity is extremely compelling. These things can have very deleterious impacts on the long-term value of a business. Even mild changes in the discount rate can, can radically alter the value um, of any business. And this is why predictability is so important. The second most important variable would be those factors that affect the terminal value, especially those factors which would affect how long this business can continue at its current level of profitability. Um, a business that can earn predictable cash flows for the next 10, 20, 30 years is by definition far more, uh, far more valuable than a company that may earn um, you know, incredible cash flows for the next three years. Um, but then after three years, um, it's unclear what it earns or there's a distribution of probabilities that what the company earns after three years is materially lower than what it is now. Um, and, you know, those are you know, classic internet bubble 1.0 type examples, Yahoo, et cetera. These were businesses that had enormous business opportunities, um, but whose um, the value of that business waned tremendously over time just because there was no longevity. And so, you know, that's why those are important. Trying to get an exact value on a business is perhaps a fool's errand. Um, and that's why many, you know, great investors try to get, you know, a back of the envelope uh, calculation of what they think is something's worth once they've made decisions about, you know, how predictable are the economics, um, you know, what kind of risk factors are they subjected to, what margins might look over time, and how long can this business endure? Uh, so that's a bit of a gist of, you know, what I'm looking for. 
Um, and so, you know, you know the, the, the real thing, the real thing to take away about this is that um, there are businesses or businesses that are very near to having all these characteristics, but they're often extremely well understood. So um, for them to be investable, you can't pay an infinite price for quality. That's what we're finding at the moment. While you could have paid almost any price for um, perceived quality in the last five, 10 years, um, and that's not a state of affairs that can persist forever. T trees don't grow to the skies. There are prices that you need to pay for assets which make them compelling. And there are prices at which those assets are no longer compelling um, and probably have a negative return. So these exist. Um, it takes you know, unusual circumstances, um, uh, you know, them being misunderstood, some kind of macro variable, um, country specific variable, um, some kind of uncertainty to give the, you know, intelligent investor an opportunity to invest in them. Um, and so there's a lot of waiting around, a lot of waiting around. So, you know, in, in terms of where I've made um, near catastrophic mistakes, um, have been places that are you know, all the antithesis of what I've spoken about before. So unproven business models, um, unpredictable management decisions. When I think about unproven business models, I think about um, subscale retailers on the internet, um, which had a one-time boost from COVID. But terrible in investments for me. And not just because the price went down, but because the business, it was very obvious the business um, lived and died by some of these external variables and that as they got bigger the perceived problems pre-COVID that many of these were facing were simply pronounced they simply got worse that's exactly the opposite of what you want to be investing in um, unpredictable management decisions I mean this would be um, you know while I don't think Zuckerberg is uh, completely making an irresponsible decision he's not betting the entire house on the new direction he wants to take uh, Facebook now meta in. Um, but that's one of those things where a considerable portion of cash flows that should be accruing to the shareholders is uh, going into you know, what I would call a, a very uh, low probability, long-tailed uh, decision to invest in technology, which is not proven, um, and you know, a very unpredictable outcome there. There's a high probability that the cash flows that should have been attributed to the shareholders will be attributable to nobody. It'd probably be captured by hardware sellers or um, you know, overpaid uh, company executives and, and engineers. It's probably where all the capital will end up. Um, market leaders operating in an unpredictable uh, end market. Uh, again, this is, this is exactly, um, those companies that are operating within extremist stand. These are companies that, um, even though they might be fantastic, they might be market leaders, great entrepreneurs, incredible market dominant position, um, fantastic return on equity assets, etc. Um, all of that, all of that does not really matter if um, they they are operating in an unpredictable end market where it's un where you're unable to see what's coming. And you know, you probably throw Facebook into this bucket as well. Um, you know, incredible monopoly market leading position. Uh, they, you know, looks like they had taken a dominant position over all their US peers. And then, you know, short form video comes out of left field. Um, it's scaling incredibly quickly. It, it's biting away at um, some of your best assets. And you don't know where the next one's going to come from. You don't know where the next TikTok's going to come from. And maybe it doesn't come, but the, the example that, you know, TikTok does exist and that, these new combinations of media are put together um, in extremely compelling ways. There's, you know, there's no way that you know what's coming next. There's probably no way to know if Zuckerberg knows what's coming next. Um, and again, this, this over time, the likelihood that your company will no longer be predictable is extremely high. Um, so I'd add companies operating in a country with an unpredictable policy regime. It, it, quite often there are businesses within any company, even sometimes when that country is communist, that are incredibly profitable. Um, again, if you can't really predict um, where the cash flows will end up, uh, it, you know, that exercise is all for nothing. Uh, quite often in you know, countries like China, um, companies with a, with a non-predictable you know, 
Commonwealth rule of law type system, um, quite often entire industries can be banned. Um, there's no recourse. And um, perhaps even if you do invest in a great monopoly business, there's no guarantee that as you, the shareholder, um, or you know, probably a minority shareholder, um, that you are going to be properly treated by the majority holders or even the, the government of where that company is operating. Again, if you never accrue the benefits to equity, it's um, pointless to own equity. Uh, unclear capital allocation decisions. So again, this is probably like an Amazon, Facebook type setup. Um, it, enormous parts of the cash flows uh, get invested in things with very unclear outcomes, um, are unable to quantify the returns uh, that that capital um, will accrue. And you see this in like the pet projects, um, the like terrible business lines that are continued year after year. Um, again, that's all capital that even if it does accrue to you eventually, it's much, much, much further out. Um, and there's no guarantee that you'll get it back. Uh, illusory cash flows have invested in companies that um, even though they looked extremely compelling, um, those cash flows are siphoned off by ongoing legal, legal costs, um, perhaps CapEx. And like some of the pet projects we talked about before, doesn't matter how profitable a company is, if 100% of the cash or even worse, 100 and something percent of the cash flows are invested into pet projects with very unclear economics. Um, again, the, it, it's like you nothing accrued to equity. Uh, unsound capital structures. Um, this is why you know it's generally a good idea to avoid it investing in companies that have a lot of debt. Um, debt makes all situations more complex. Um, this is, you know, unsound capital structures would be, you know, one with you know, short-term liabilities, um, you know, extreme covenants on the debt. Um, you know, you need to be a lawyer to really figure out what's going on. It simply complicates the investment. Um, sometimes these these can offer, you know, quite good value opportunities. You need to really know what you're doing, though. Um, and then, you know, those companies which are operating basically at the whim of another company, um, these are like some of the online retailers, even a Facebook. You know, these are these are companies that are subject to the whims um, of another company. They don't they don't control their own destiny. Um, so yeah, those are the kind of things I'm looking for. Um, over the last year or so, I've kind of been working down uh, my own uh, watch lists. Um, trying to really zero in on companies that have um, these characteristics. Um, you know, I'll talk about a few of these in the weeks to come. Uh, anyways, thanks for watching and, you know, we'll see you soon.